Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. The topic of this webinar is implementing expanded RPSs in Illinois and Michigan. We have two guest speakers with us from those states who are going to give us presentations on what is going on there. Uh, and this webinar is being hosted by Warren Leon, who is the Executive Director uh, here at the Clean Energy States Alliance. This webinar is a presentation of the Clean Energy States Alliance for the RPS Collaborative. And uh, when I pass this over to Warren, he will be telling you a bit more about that. Before we do that, uh, a few quick housekeeping notes. All of our uh, attendees for this webinar are in listen-only mode. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of this webinar. You can either call in using a telephone, or you can connect using your computer, mic, and speakers. There are some instructions on your screen for that. Uh, a very important note, we ask that you please submit your questions as you think of them throughout the webinar by typing them into the question box on your webinar console and hitting send. We will be reading through your questions as they come in, and we'll save about 15 minutes at the end of our presentations for a Q&A with the audience. So. Uh, make sure that you type your question in as you think of it. Don't wait until the end, and we will get to as many questions as we can. A final note, this webinar is being recorded. You will find a recording of this webinar, as well as all of our previous CESA and RPS Collaborative webinars, on our website at cesa.org backslash webinars. So with that, I will pass it over to our host for this webinar, Warren Leon. Hey, thank you very much, Samantha. As um, Samantha mentioned, this webinar is being hosted by the Clean Energy States Alliance. We're a national organization composed primarily of state um, energy agencies and energy-related organizations. You could see our members up on this page. Um, we do a lot of information sharing. We do group activities with our members. And one of the things we also do is manage the RPS Collaborative, as you'll see on the next slide, which is an enterprise funded by the Energy Foundation and the U.S. Department of Energy. And it encourages state RPS administrators, federal agency representatives, and a wide range of other stakeholders to exchange ideas and information related to the challenges to implementing state RPSs, and we try to focus on solutions to overcome those challenges. We produce a monthly newsletter that is free, and it talks about what's going on around the country in the wonderful world of RPS. Uh, we do webinars like this, and we do an annual RPS summit in Washington, D.C. To sign up, just go to our website, www.csa.org, to learn more. And if we could go to the next slide. You know, today we're going to be focusing on two states that have made recent important and very interesting changes to their RPSs. And we're going to learn how the RPSs in those states are changing, uh, why the changes were made, and how the states are going about planning for the new era with their expanded and changed RPS. I'm going to inter introduce the first of our speakers now, and I'll introduce the second one when she speaks. And our first speaker is going to be Brian Granahan, who's chief legal counsel of the Illinois Power Agency. Now, that agency is an independent state agency tasked with developing procurement plans and conducting energy capacity and renewables procurement events for the state of Illinois and for its electric utilities. Brian began his career as an associate with Sidley Austin LLP, and he worked as a clean energy advocate and staff attorney with Environment Illinois before he shifted to the public sector. Uh, his first positions at the, in the public sector were at the Illinois Commerce Commission, where he served as a policy advisor to acting chairman Manuel Flores and to chairman Douglas Scott. 
He was also a vice president with the strategic consulting firm of Tour Partners, LLC, and he's a former board member of the Illinois Environmental Council and Green Economy Chicago. And in his current role, he's right in the middle of planning for some fairly dramatic and interesting changes that are taking place to the Illinois energy landscape, and he's going to tell you about that now. Thank you, Warren. Um, and I appreciate the introduction. As Warren said, there's been a lot of changes in Illinois recently, and we'll get into those, also provide some background on the agency itself, because the Illinois Power Agency, for those who aren't familiar with it, is sort of sits in an odd spot uh, among the constellation of state agencies that we see state by state. Um, we now have an expanded renewable energy portfolio standard in Illinois. It will allow us to do a lot more on renewables than had been done before. And it's a very exciting time and a time where there's a lot happening here and a lot of inbound inquiries coming into our offices um, as we try to prepare for an era in which we're going to be conducting a lot more renewables procurement activity. So just a quick overview of the Illinois Power Agency. Our primary tasks are to develop procurement plans and conduct procurement events to meet the load requirements of those customers in Illinois who still take supply from the utilities. And that's exclusively residential and small commercial customers. At some portion of the market at any point in time, it could be of those customers about half, it could be more, it could be less, depending upon how much traction retail supply offers are getting in the marketplace. Through this, we also are responsible for a lot of elements of renewable energy portfolio standard compliance for the state, such as in the past, at least, it's going to change a little bit going forward, as I'll describe, but through our annual procurement plans that we would prepare, we would have a chapter in there on renewable energy resources and discuss how for at least the utility supplied load, we would be meeting the targets in the statute um, through procurement events of renewable energy credits uh, to make sure those targets were satisfied in the upcoming delivery years. And then there's other special projects that come up every now and then that we're asked to do. There's been different clean coal facilities proposed, and there's always an IPA component associated with those, though none of those have come totally to fruition. And then occasionally special reports, as I'll get into in a, in a second as well, that we're asked to do. We're in a bit of an odd spot because we're actually overseen by the state's Executive Ethics Commission, which, because it has to adjudicate uh, ethics complaints against executive branch officials is somewhat independent of the governor's office. So our director is actually appointed by the Executive Ethics Commission, uh, although confirmed by the Senate through a standard process for gubernatorial appointees. So it's an interesting agency. We conduct functions that I think in a lot of states are handled by the utilities themselves or might bleed over into the Public Utility Commission space. Um, and we've been in place since about 2007. Bit of an overview on the act that just passed then, or passed in November. The negotiations on this really began in earnest in that 2014-2015 time frame. Specifically, go back to May of 2014, four state agencies were requested through an Illinois House resolution to conduct an analysis of what would happen if you took a few at-risk nuclear plants in Illinois offline. And that kind of provided the groundwork for what gave the political heft to be able to get some things done on renewables. There have been some proposals in the legislature the prior years around what was called fixing the RPS for reasons that I'll get into in a bit and explaining the background of our state's RPS before these changes. Um, but once we were asked to conduct these analyses of what might happen in a world where these nuclear plants went offline, you started to see that, okay, there's probably going to be some sort of proposal coming in at least the next few years that's focused on making sure that uh, plants in Illinois' nuclear fleet that weren't profitable would actually stay online. And through this process, in 2015, you saw legislative proposals developed by Exelon, which owns six nuclear plants in Illinois, focused on specifically providing support to nuclear facilities. You saw Commonwealth Edison, the distribution utility that's uh, owned by Exelon, they had their utility the future uh, proposals that involved uh, funding for microgrids, electric vehicle charging stations, changes to rate design, all sorts of other things, voltage optimization. Then you had the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition, which had been for years working on RPS issues uh, through its member groups. And they were focused on fixing and consolidating our state's RPS to make it more functional to drive new generation and also wanted to expand the state's energy efficiency portfolio standard and had a few other related concerns that was part of their proposal. All of this kind of came together in 2016 with a bill that really came probably in the fall of 2016. You started to see it really coalesce. And, and 
and it was considered by the Illinois General Assembly and was called our veto session, which is uh, session weeks that take place after the elections that year. In November and December of 2016, uh, the RPS Collaborative the Annual Summit was actually happening as this bill was being actively considered by the Illinois General Assembly uh, back in late November and early December of 2016. It was passed in December 1st, 2016, signed into law on December 7th. That timeline was driven largely by the nuclear issues and that Exelon had to have some clarity on whether or not they might have the opportunity for additional revenue for certain at-risk facilities uh, or make announcements related to their closure. So that's where you ended up with something having to happen right in that December time frame. Because it didn't pass in a supermajority, it passed during veto session um, before the end of the calendar year, it couldn't have an immediate effective date. The effective date was instead set for June 1st, 2017. And um, for us, given the amount of work that we have to do under the new law, I think that's probably a good thing because it gives us a, a lot more time to ramp up those activities. So if we look at what else is in that public act besides the RPS, and these are things that we won't be discussing as part of today's webinar, but are probably of interest to a lot of participants on the webinar, and uh, my contact information is in the slides. Feel free to follow up if you have more questions about it. One is the development of a zero emission credit procurement program through which we develop a zero emission credit procurement plan and procurement events. And that's specifically focused on the environmental attributes of nuclear facilities. And that's something that uh, we, we've got a couple of lawsuits filed against the agency attempting to enjoin us from doing work on this. Um, it's been the subject of litigation as well in New York State, I believe. And we're working our way through some of those issues right now. Um, once the bill is effective, we have about 45 days to produce a plan in order to do this. And I'll just be put before the Illinois Commerce Commission for their approval. It's something that, um, you know, we'll, we'll take, I'm sure, quite a bit of our time as, uh, after the effective date of the bill as well. There's also major expansions and significant revisions to the state's energy efficiency portfolio standards, specifically folding in voltage optimization to be more aggressive energy efficiency targets. Um, you have larger targets, larger budgets available to meet those targets, and you have more work being consolidated with the utilities as the administrator and moving them away from a state agency that have been doing some of that. And then also changes to net metering and a per kilowatt uh, credit offered for some new distributed photovoltaic systems. Those changes aren't really part of the core things that we'll be talking about today, but all probably very interesting and things that you can read up more about, I'm sure, if you so wish. So. To give you an overview of where things have been and what our Illinois RPS looked like, uh, just a brief history here, it was initially enacted in 2007 as part of the same legislation that gave rise to our agency, the Illinois Power Agency, and also created the state's energy efficiency portfolio standard. But initially enacted, it really only addressed the load served by the utilities, customers who actually took supply from the utilities, which isn't that big. Uh, an amount of the entire marketplace. It's only maybe 15 to 20 percent. At that point in time, it might have been a bit higher. But all of the big commercial industrial customers um, are taking supply from alternative suppliers. So if you don't have a compliance mechanism that addresses them, you have a lot of load that's out there that isn't actually subject to an RPS. So in 2009, there was a mechanism created for alternative retail electric supplier or ARIES compliance uh, that's fundamentally different than what was being done for those customers who took supply with the utilities. So the mechanisms of compliance have varied by customer supply source. For the IPA, you have a surcharge on customers' bills if they take supply from the utility, and then we conduct procurement events with the utilities the resulting counterparties uh, to meet those targets. And then for retail electric suppliers, they have a combination of alternative compliance payments and self-procurements that we make with those compliance payments going into a fund that's administered by the IPA. Um, that the targets and the goals have been met through renewable energy resources, which means either renewable energy credits or those credits and the associated energy. So we have some bundled contracts that we've entered into. And for the ARIES, um, alternative compliance payments can be made to satisfy some portion of their obligation. So the compliance responsibility through this scheme falls to the IPA, the ICC in its quasi-adjudicatory function and its regulatory function over alternative retail electric suppliers, the utilities themselves who serve as the counterparties to the resulting contracts, at least for the, um, those customers that they're actually providing supply to, and the retail electric suppliers who have to self-procure or make compliance payments. If you look at this, this creates these uh, different silos, really. You have uh, different standards for each. For the eligible retail customers, 
you know, you've got 25% by 2025, which is the standard that we have through the revisions to the law, but it's only being applied to that portion of load, and you have carve-outs individually for wind, 75% for wind, 6% for photovoltaics, 1% for distributed generation, um, and then you have this IPA process that makes sure that those targets are met. For the ARIES, you have self-procurement, which can be RECs from anywhere in PJM and MISO, and then alternative compliance payments that just go into this fund administered by the agency, um, and that's monitored by the ICC. And then for those customers that are on an hourly pricing tariff, they're making alternative compliance payments. Those are actually held by utility, but um, subject to the IPA planning process, similar to eligible retail customers. This created a whole host of challenges. Um, just at a basic level, if you have load shifting between the utilities and alternative suppliers, and you have different compliance mechanisms for each, and you have different funds that can be used in order to ensure that compliance, and you have limitations on the amount of funds that you can actually spend uh, due to rate impact caps and things of that nature, it's very difficult to engage in any sort of long-term planning because you don't know what sort of funding is going to be available in the coming years. And if you have targets that are multiplied by the amount of load that falls into that category, you don't know what those targets are going to be in the coming years. So in 2010, there were a bunch of long-term power purchase agreements entered into um, for the supply customers of the utilities, uh, the 2010 LTPPAs, and primarily wind farms, but also some new solar facilities. And those were bundled contracts for both Rex and Energy, and they ended up as a bunch of load shifted away from the utilities in two renewable or two retail suppliers. Um, they ended up taking up pretty much all of the funds that were available for that sort of planning around the RPS. And that was through municipal aggregation. You had some headroom there where retail suppliers could come in and make better offers to customers than the default supply rate due to some contracts that were entered into before energy prices really dipped. And as a result of that, a uh, number of communities banded together, negotiated supply rates with those suppliers, got their customers um, through opt-out provisions in the law onto those alternative suppliers rates, and as a result, you had a lot of customers migrating away from the utilities, and you had no budget available then to do any sort of future procurements out of. And you had the target satisfied just by those contracts alone. Then you had an increase in the amount of alternative compliance payments that were coming in, but they were going into a state fund that had a whole host of challenges associated with using it. One was that you were supposed to use it in conjunction with the procurement that was being done to serve the utility customers, but there were no procurements being done to serve the utility customers. Another is the state borrowing and in some instances just taking from that fund to patch over other gaps, such as with the state's general revenue fund. And then if you're looking at all of this and you don't have a lot of certainty regarding what's available going forward, uh, you probably end up with a lot of one-year contracts for RECs from facilities from wherever will qualify, and you're not really using the funds that are being pooled together to drive the development of new generation. And I think for a lot of environmental advocates, that was their concern and what they saw was broken about the old RPS, was that with these different buckets and with all the uncertainty going forward and with the fact that you had a lot of money held by the state, with the state having larger budget problems, there just wasn't really the resources available to have money pooled together under an RPS that actually drove new project development that would help better achieve some of the environmental goals that drove the development of the RPS in the first place. So the approach in Public Act 99-0906 is to move away from that type of siloed, fractured approach and onto something that is, number one, focused on a single pathway for compliance, with the IPA being uh, responsible for the development of a long-term renewable resources plan to say how we're going to meet those targets going forward, and with those targets applying to all retail customer load. And number two, focused on having the funds that are being collected work more toward actually incenting the development of new generation, and specifically to the extent possible, um, local generation where some of the, the benefits associated with it are captured by Illinois residents. So as a result, uh, we have a 25 by 25% 25 by 2025 standard still in place, just as we had before. But as opposed to this only applying to utility served load, now it applies to all retail customer load, including that load which is uh, currently served by alternative suppliers. And the pathway toward meeting that is done through a long-term renewable resources plan, which the, IG, the IPA has about 120 days after the effective date of the law to develop. Then we have 45 days in which we take comments on that plan, 21 days to revise the plan according to those comments, and we file it with the Illinois Commerce Commission, which is our state's Public Utilities Commission, 
for the approval of that plan. And that plan, which can be updated every two years, sets forth how we're planning on meeting those targets going forward, what sorts of procurement events we'll be conducting, potentially things like contract length. Um, all those sorts of issues can be fleshed out through an administrative proceeding where all parties will have the ability to offer input on them. And we'll have the ability to kind of set a path going forward in the long term. And then before that happens, though, we're to conduct initial four procurements um, for wind and solar, specifically one million recs to be delivered annually from new utility-scale solar facilities and new brownfield projects, brownfield solar projects, and then one million recs from new utility-scale wind facilities. Those occur on slightly different timelines between wind and solar, but they're things that we do before we actually even put this long-term resources plan in place to give the market something to drive new project development before the things that are more long-term looking are actually fixed through this administrative process. In addition to this, we're also to develop an adjustable block program, which in other states often is described as a declining block program, but because the blocks could potentially go up or down in price, um, we call it adjustable block program here in Illinois to support the development of community solar and distributed generation projects. This is very different from how the IPA had previously worked. Uh, previously, we had conducted competitive procurement processes, which is what we'll be doing for the initial forward procurements, with bids selected on the basis of price. The adjustable block program offers project developers some price transparency, uh, which ultimately may be important for having a program that operates at scale where we can meet more aggressive targets for the amount of new build that comes through and um, creates more of kind of an ongoing process as opposed to something where we're conducting a discrete procurement event at one point in time and maybe conducting one six months to, 10 to 12 months later. Additionally, a lot of the money that had been collected through alternative compliance payments, which currently sits in the Renewable Energy Resources Fund in Illinois, will be mobilized to fund a low-income solar program known as the Illinois Solar for All program. And that provides a host of new opportunities for low-income solar projects, low-income community solar projects, uh, public sector and nonprofit projects, and also some pilot projects. So one of the big tasks for our, for our agency going forward is developing something that is a mechanism for driving low-income participation in the clean energy economy. Uh, the utilities themselves are also tasked with responsibilities around job trainee programs to ensure that low-income residents participate in the clean energy economy um, through working on the projects themselves, maybe as trainees on installations, for instance, and we'll be partnering with them and making sure that our procurement processes to help drive new generation also works alongside their processes for having new job trainees as part of all of this. So what are our big takeaways here? We, saw, we talked through where we were in Illinois and uh, what about where we are now after Public Act 99-0906 passed. Well, the first thing, not on the screen, is that it's important to remember that we're not quite there yet. The, the effective date of the law is actually June 1st, 2017. Our plan is to have some workshops in the early May time frame and then put out questions to workshop child participants and others to try to put a finer point in some things as we develop a better understanding of all the things that we'll have to do. So there's still a lot of work to come before we're actually seeing some of the things that are talked about conceptually in that bill uh, become actual proposals, let alone programs that entities can participate in. So there's a fair amount of time here, and as it stands right now, the, the governing law is still the prior RPS until June 1st. But the big takeaway is that now we have a streamlining compliance mechanism that lends itself to longer-term planning. So we had these three separate siloed compliance mechanisms previously. Uh, now we've moved that into one, where you have funds pooled each year that are collected at the full amount that can be spent and potentially even rolled over into future years allowing for a long-term planning process with goals around things like new build, and specifically new build from utility-scale solar, new build from um, utility-scale wind. And then you also have the development of an adjustable block program to support distributed generation and community solar. That's all subject to 25% by 2025 targets, but now those targets apply again to all retail customer load. So the actual effect of that target, as opposed to just sort of the thing that goes in the fact sheet, is significantly expanded beyond what it was previously. So we have this long-term view of RPS compliance that we're taking through the development of a long-term renewable resources plan and then the opportunity to update that every two years. So if there's elements of what we've proposed in terms of procurements that maybe simply isn't working or we realize that we have a much bigger gap between those percentage-based targets and what we have under contract than we thought previously, 
we have the opportunity to update our long-term plan and call for new procurements in order to meet those, those updated standards. Um, <clears throat> there's an increased focus on capturing benefits. This isn't something that maybe I've talked as much about, but um, now we have for RECs that can meet the Illinois RPS, there's an assumption that anything that's in-state automatically qualifies, and then out-of-state facilities, if they can show that they meet certain public interest criteria, focus on benefits delivered to Illinois residents, they may qualify as well. But because you know you have perfect clarity on Illinois facilities qualifying, I think it's maybe fair to expect that we'll see a lot of Illinois-based new generation come out of these sorts of changes to the RPS. The changes to the procurement process itself are probably more relevant to people who've spent time operating under the old RPS, participating in our procurement processes, and understand how we conducted those. Those who submit bids, they're selected on the basis of price. It's all blind. Um, the winning bidders, they don't know each, the, the, the bidders don't know the bids of the other market participants. Um, you, you just submit the bid that you think makes the most sense, and you hope that it's selected, and you have a confidential benchmark that applies to knock out anything that would be maybe an unreasonable price bid. Now we move toward an adjustable block program that's more open, more transparent, more public facing, uh, specifically for distributed generation and for community solar with additional incentives available for low income projects as well. And there's also more granularity in project type. Now we have carve outs for things like brownfields. We have a specific focus on low income solar and funds dedicated specifically to low income solar. Community solar wasn't really available previously in Illinois without any sort of virtual net metering program. Uh, now we have uh, areas of the law that are specifically focused and carve-outs specifically focused on community solar project development. We have uh, carve-outs specifically focused on very, very small system size under the Adjustable Block DG program. So there's a little more focus on, as opposed to just thinking about things in terms of wind and solar or, or even at a broader level thinking about things in terms of renewables, now we're breaking out specific project types and creating sub-targets associated with those um, as part of our RPS expansion. So hopefully that provided a useful overview of some of the changes to the Illinois RPS. Um, my contact information is up on the screen here, certainly available for any questions in the coming weeks if there's things that come up that we can't address as part of today's webinar. And I hope this was all somewhat informative. And thank you. Hey, thank you, Brian. That was really quite impressive to cover that much ground in a short time when the changes are so complicated. And I now feel like I actually um, understand the Illinois RPS for the first time. Um, let's go to our second presentation. And afterwards, we'll have questions. And if anybody listening in, you have questions, submit them at any time. So they'll be in the queue for the question period. So we're now going to turn our attention to Michigan. And we're fortunate to have with us today to talk about Michigan, Katie Traxell who's a member of the Michigan Public Service Commission staff, and she's manager of the Renewable Energy Credit Registry, or MIREX, that's used to track compliance with Michigan's renewable energy portfolio. Katie is a certified public accountant, and she has more than 10 years of direct utility and utility regulation experience. Her current responsibilities include performing compliance and reconciliation examinations, reviewing utility contracts and requests for proposals, examining rates and tariffs, monitoring proposed and past Michigan and national renewable energy legislation, um, resolving inquiries on financial and taxation matters, and finally, performing community outreach. So she's in a good position to explain how the Michigan RPS is changing and how the Michigan Public Service Commission is going about planning for those changes. Well, good afternoon from Michigan. As Warren said, I'm Katie Traxel, and I'm happy to be speaking to you today about what has been a unique couple of months here in Michigan and promises to continue to be interesting as we work through implementation of the new law. The last time I spoke to many of you in this group, it was early December. And although we in the state had just received an open letter from our governor to our legislative members, 
in which the governor urged the legislative members to pass the energy package, there were many doubters in the state that the energy package I will speak of today would become law. After all, it had been over two years of negotiations and multiple sponsors of multiple bills, and the session was quickly coming to a close. So I won't keep you in suspense any longer, um, and I'll let you know, and you can see it on the slide, that um, unlike what we thought in December, the legislation did indeed pass. In fact, on what could have been the last session day, our governor pulled an all-nighter and was working on compromises and negotiations throughout that night. The legislation was passed on December 15th and signed by the governor the next week. The law takes effect 120 days after enactment on April 20th, 2007. Sorry, yes, 2017. The past energy package consists of two bills. First, Public Act 341 updates current laws related to utility rate cases, electric choice, certificate of necessity, and electric capacity resource adequacy. And the law establishes renewable energy planning processes. Second, and the focus of today's presentation, is Public Act 342 which updates our current laws related to renewable energy, energy waste reduction, and net metering and distributed generation. Energy waste reduction may not be a term that's familiar to, to many of you. And energy waste reduction is really just the new name for what we had previously called energy optimization, which is commonly called energy efficiency. Public Act 342 also allows regulated electric and gas utilities to implement on-bill financing programs, which is so important in helping to reduce energy waste. The Amendatory Act, which is Public Act 342, increases the renewable energy standard to 15% for 2021. The current law in Michigan states that the renewable energy standard was 10% by 2015. The standard was then to stay constant with the same number of renewable energy credits required for each utility and for each year throughout the duration of the 20-year plan period, which was set to end in 2029. Now, though, the current standard will only remain in place for 2016, 2017, and 2018. Beginning in 2019 and continuing into 2020, the standard will change to an interim 12.5%. The interim percentage is to be calculated based on prior year retail sales. This means that in 2019, the requirement is 12.5% of 2018 retail sales, or 12.5% of a three-year average of retail sales, depending on what is selected by the individual utility. The standard is recalculated for the updated retail sales for the 2020 12.5% requirement. The RPS maxes out in 2021 when the standard is increased to 15% of prior year retail sales. In a dramatic change from the current law, the standard would no longer apply after 2021. Although the rate regulated providers will be required to specify amounts of renewable energy that are proposed in their integrated resource plans, and they will need to provide an explanation if proposed amounts of renewable energy are below 15%. This is also a change in what we'd come to expect, as under current law, all providers 
whether they be investor owned, municipal, or alternative suppliers, were to have met and continued to meet the requirements. Public Act 342 retains the renewable energy cost recovery provisions that are found within the current law. It does, though, remove the requirement that incremental cost of compliance be recovered through a surcharge that is itemized on the customer's bill. This allows for less transparent billing to customers in the state. The amendatory law also allows for additional technologies to be counted as renewable energy resources. Advanced waste energy, geothermal heat pumps, and steam equivalent resources are now to count toward meeting the renewable energy standard. And now to get into the, the real meat of the presentation here, which is the implementation of our law. Unlike with our current law, which was passed and immediately went into effect, Public Act 342 has the 120-day implementation period, which is quickly ticking away. Also, unlike the current law, which had a temporary order from the Commission, which provided guidance on the implementation of the Act and included templates for filing, guidelines to be used, and further definitions and interpretations of passages found within the legislation. The Amendatory Act has not enjoyed that same guidance. Rather, implementation of Public Acts 341 and 342 is being done through individual work plans that focus on each set of responsibilities that the Michigan Public Service Commission has under the Amendatory Act. Each set of responsibilities was assigned a team leader who was then in charge of creating a work plan to implement the legislative requirement. Leading activities related to implementation of specific provisions, assembling a team to assist in implementation, assigning work related to implementation, and the team leaders are responsible for ensuring that schedules are met. A steering committee of Commission Office staff was created. The steering committee has the task of meeting with these team leaders on a regular basis, of tracking overall implementation progress, and of communicating this progress with the commissioners. I am happy to say that there has been what seems to be very open communication between the Commission office and the staff. Also, each of these individual work groups I mentioned are staff-led, and this has helped the morale of staff as we have been fully included in the implementation. An additional positive outcome of the staff-created work groups is that a majority, if not all, of the teams assigned to each work plan are multi-sectional, if not divisionally, represented. It has been nice to see that when staff was given the opportunity to form their own work teams, the siloing of divisions that has sometimes occurred has seemed to vanish. Part of the open communication between staff and the Commission Office has occurred through the creation of a SharePoint site where all work plans are listed, even for those staff not in the regular team leader meeting. Updates on the implementation of the law, memos written, and presentations given to staff are found on this site. Again, the communication provided by the Commission Office to staff cannot be overstated and how important that is to staff who are the ones ultimately implementing the law. Many of the work plans I've mentioned include outreach with external stakeholders as a key component of the plan. As such, collaboratives and meetings have begun with these stakeholders. The stakeholders include utility, 
environmental, and ratepayer representative group, as well as industry players. To that end, and to help communication with the public, the Michigan Public Service Commission is planning to go live with a website on March 15th, which will provide information to the public about the work teams that have been created. The statutory sections, which the work teams are involved in implementing, the team leader, the milestones, and the next steps for each team. The website will provide the ability for the public to indicate an interest in being informed of any activities related to that team, including stakeholder engagement opportunities. Listservs will be created to help our communication with the public, and I invite any of you that are interested to take a look at the MPSC website next week and sign up. And lastly today, I'll talk briefly about another section of interest in the legislation, that of a statewide goal. In 2015, our governor stated in his energy message that over the next 10 years, 30 to 40 percent of our energy in Michigan can come from the cleanest sources, which he defined as renewable energy and the reduction of energy waste. Following that lead, the Amendatory Act, Public Act 342, created and stated that, as a goal, not less than 35% of Michigan's electric needs should be met through a combination of energy waste reduction and renewable energy by 2025. The Act includes the condition that this goal is to be met if the investments in energy waste reduction and renewable energy are the most reasonable and prudent means of meeting an electric utility energy and capacity needs relative to other resource options. Progress toward the goal, while there is no legislative consequence if it is not met, is to be shown by utilities within the IRP which are regularly filed integrated resource plans. And I'll note that as with our standard, the goal can be met with renewable energy credits purchased with or without the associated renewable energy. And with that, I'll finish by thanking the RPS Collaborative and CISA particularly for inviting me to present, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you. Hey, Katie, thanks very much. That was very clear and well organized and gives us a pic good picture of what's going on in Michigan. Um, there are a number of questions that have come in that I'm going to ask, but there's room for some more questions. So if anybody on the line has additional questions you want to ask, type them in. And just to note, there are a couple of questions that in relationship to Illinois, which really talk about things before the new legislation that I'm not going to get into. But the first question is for you, Brian, um, and somebody is asking whether virtual net metering projects will be eligible in the utility scale procurement, or will those projects need to wait for the adjustable block? I believe they would need to wait for the adjustable block, but I don't want to say anything authoritative until we've taken kind of a, a, a little bit closer look at that. But that had been my impression, at least. Um, and it's, there's a couple of things, there's a couple kind of moving pieces there that the interpretation of each would impact the status of a project like that for the utility scale procurement. Um, I, I, I think We'll be releasing rules around the initial four procurements for utility scale resources probably sometime in um, June, uh, July, that will bring some clarity to it. This may be a topic that comes up at workshops that we hold in May, and maybe some of the re request additional information around. My first blush response would be that they wouldn't be eligible, but 
I don't want to say that as a fixed matter until I've done a little bit more comprehensive review. Thank you. And um, Katie, you now have in the state these higher targets for the RPS in the coming years. Is the perception at the Public Service Commission going to be that these targets are going to be very hard to achieve, or are they likely to be relatively easy to achieve or somewhere in between? I like that third option, Warren. <laughs> somewhere, somewhere in between. We do have quite a few utilities um, who are who have already obtained um, the capacity and the the credits to reach um, the higher percentages. I'll also mention um, another avenue making it slightly easier for the utilities and that is that our renewable energy credits are changing under the new the mandatory act from having a three-year life to having a five-year life and that will of course um, help with compliance um, as well as the shorter planning period um, again because compliance is set to end in 2021 rather than extending through 2029 so all of those um, will help to have our utilities be able to meet the goal. Good, thank you. And here are a couple of related questions about Illinois for you, Brian. Um, can you describe again the process of Illinois' three compliance mechanisms converting to one, and will the change affect 2017 compliance? And here's the other question that <coughs> relates to this. Are ARIs required to still use ACPs for 50% of their obligation in the period from June 1, 2017 through May 31, 2019? There's a step-down process for alternative retail electric supplier compliance um, where as we shift toward a system that is essentially a single delivery services charge applicable to all customers, because the areas had previously paid alternative compliance payments and self-procured RECs, there's a transition period where those goals actually decline and we move over to a delivery service charge over a two-year period. I forget the actual amounts and numbers. Um, it's a process that's monitored and overseen by the Illinois Commerce Commission, so I also don't want to step on their authority in terms of how they're interpreting what's eligible for individual delivery years. I know there's some open questions around that. But um, it's not the case that it's 50% for that full period. Uh, it does decline over time as we move more toward a delivery services charge and additional details are available through the law. Uh, what was the first part of that question? I'm sorry. The first part, describe again the process of how the three compliance mechanisms will be converting into one. Sure. The, the, the big explanation or the kind of big picture way of looking at it is that we're moving from a supply charge to a delivery services charge. And all customers who take delivery services from in Illinois, it's Commonwealth Edison or Amber in Illinois, or for you know, some portion of the mid-American uh, companies, Illinois Load, they will then be paying a surcharge from their bill no matter whether they receive supply from an alternative supplier or whether they receive it from the utility itself. But there is, again, a transition period there where alternative, unlike with the customers who took supply from the utility where they paid a surcharge previously on their bill, the actual retail suppliers themselves were responsible for RPS obligations related to that customer's load. And that will continue to be the case. There'll be kind of a shared responsibility between the two for two years until we move into a full delivery, delivery services charge funded RPS system that has kind of a single mechanism of pooling funds together and using them for compliance. One other issue is that previously alternative compliance payments made by retail electric suppliers had gone to the state. Specifically, they are made to the Illinois Commerce Commission and then the ICC deposited those into a fund that was administered by the IPA. Going forward, our interpretation is that those would then go to the utilities, which is important because if they're not held by the state, then they can't be subject to uh, the different machinations of the state legislature wanting to take them out and use them for other purposes. I know that there's some language in the act that indicates maybe they wouldn't. Um, our, our, our reading has been that they go to the utilities and it's, it's somewhat unequivocal. 
but I suppose there isn't full clarity around that until um, the Illinois Commerce Commission says more about compliance obligations. They would be the ones who would say, hey, retail supplier, here's how you comply going forward. Okay, thank you. And Katie, um, this has to do with the relationship between the RPS and the 35% goal. If the 15% renewable energy requirement ends in 2022, um, what incentives will the utilities have to be working towards the 20, 35% goal in 2025, how, how would the state get to that 35% goal? Well, again, I'd like to state that the goal in also, well, it's a combination of energy waste reduction and renewable energy. Yes. So we're not looking for utilities to get an additional 20%. Um, but how the goal is structured differently than the RPS is the, the goal, again, the combination that is just for, although it's stated as a statewide goal, um, the tracking mechanism of that goal um, after the 2021 timeframe and compliance year is, is completed will be only for our rate regulated um, providers and they will need to um, mention within their IRPs the um, if they're going to go below um, that 15, that original 15%. And our governor, um, if you'd like to get more information on that energy message, but he's a huge proponent of reducing energy waste. So we fully expect um, a good portion of that goal um, to be from reducing energy waste. Okay, good. And Brian, what's the carve-out amount for community solar and how much low-income solar is envisioned? Well, I'll take the second of those first because there isn't a great answer to the second, so I can at least explain why. Um, for low-income solar, we have, there aren't specific installed capacity targets in the law. Instead, what we have is the development of a program through which we provide an additional incentive for through kind of four sub-programs for different project types. And the amount of funds that are available, since it's more a function of budget than it is targets as far as this goes, um, right now we have a state fund that has about $187 million in it. Maybe 27 or so of that is committed to existing contracts. So let's just say there's $160 million of that to work with. That would all be used toward the low-income solar program and associated administrative expenses with the payments primarily going um, for renewable energy credits, a 15-year contract of the, for the RECs off of low-income solar projects, projects that qualify um, as part of the program, and then also associated expenses with us hiring a third-party program administrator and building out uh, kind of the public-facing elements of this program so that parties can participate. In terms of installed capacity that would result from that process, I think we really don't have a great deal of visibility into it. And I'd be hesitant to give any type of estimate because, in part, the money is there now, but it, we don't know if it will be there going forward. As I think a lot of people know, Illinois has had some pretty serious budget woes. And, um, you know, it's been the case in the past, in March of 2015, they looked at that fund, saw that there was money that wasn't spent out of that fund, and took $98 million of it to patch a hole in the state's general revenue fund. We don't know what that looks like going forward, and we don't know how much of that money will be available. We know that it is a very high priority item for uh, environmental advocates down in Springfield, making sure that that money is not taken out of the Renewable Energy Resources Fund. But the reality is that any big bargain that is made around the state's budget is, well, you know, it's going to happen at a level to where some of that advocacy may be effective, but um, there's a big compromise that has to be struck involving leadership, and a lot of interests may be overlooked when that compromise comes because of the magnitude of the problem that, that we have to solve. With respect to community solar carve-out, um, there's, through the adjustable block program, I believe there's a 25% through community solar of those contracts that are entered into in the adjustable block program uh, target that's present in the law. 
what that means in terms of installed capacity, um, we don't quite know at this point. We, you know, it also depends, on, I suppose, on the extent to which community solar really gets good traction um, with, with ratepayers in Illinois, and we just don't know yet, having never developed a community solar project here. But we don't have a, a specific um, megawatt hour or rec target in the law for community solar as we do for utility scale procurements going forward, where uh, our initial forward procurement is 1 million recs from solar projects and 1 million recs from wind projects. And then by 2020, we've got um, 2 million, um, with some portion of that coming from community solar projects. We don't really have that as sort of a fixed way with respect to community solar. It kind of lumped in with DG on a lot of fronts. OK, great. And Katie, um, somebody wrote in and asked, under the new law, the surcharge is no longer itemized. Um, and if you know if that's true, if you know the reason for that, and how does that relate to transparency? Warren, that is a, a true statement. And yes, it does allow for less transparent billing to customers in the state. Um, I am unsure of the reason um, behind that. The, our current law did state that it needed to be itemized, and the new law took that language out. Um, but again, not sure of, of the reasoning. Um, I will mention that we do have very few utilities who are actually, um, even under the current law, who had a, a surcharge. So um, thankfully, that, that's gone down. Um, the number of utilities who have had that maximum surcharge or even any surcharge at all for renewable energy has gone down over the last few years. OK, great. Um, I have one question for each of you that more has to do with internal staffing at your agencies. And for Katie first, you talked about how the work groups are multi-sectional and bringing people together from different sections and different divisions. For folks who don't understand how the PSC is structured, could you give an example of what some of those different sections and divisions are? I can, yes. Um, for, for instance, I'll start with the section that I'm in, I am in a, well, it's truly called the renewable energy section. And so we have been focused um, exclusively on renewable energy issues, whether it's been advocating or um, dealing with the compliance of the current law. And on the other side of the building um, are folks that are working um, daily on tariff issues and rate cases and more um, rate-based um, issues. And so it's been, as I mentioned in the presentation, it's been nice to see that um, multiple divisions, not only um, the one I'm in that works with renewable energy and energy efficiency, but that we are talking to the folks who will be created these tariffs. There are, um, because the new legislation um, doesn't necessarily break out, or doesn't silo the tariff as the um, old legislation did, as our current law did, we will need to be working with um, these different divisions to create tariffs on the books for, um, for DG, for distributed, for net metering, for green pricing program, um, voluntary green pricing program for utilities. So they are all um, multi-divisional, multi-sectional um, work groups that are in place. And that's been nice to see. Great. And the last question, Brian. Um, this legislation that passed recently, you know, it seems like it's putting an awful lot more on the agenda of the Illinois Power Agency. Does this mean that your agency is has additional resources to get staff and other and consultants or whatever you need to implement these new tasks? And not only resources, but also 
in the law itself, it um, allows or calls for us to hire third-party consultants to carry out some of the objectives. So for instance, a third-party consultant uh, to serve as a program administrator for the Low Income Solar Program, um, third-party consultants who work on the Adjustable Block Program. And then traditionally, our agency has often done work through third-party consultants through our procurement uh, planning consultant who helps us develop our annual procurement plans and through our procurement administrator who we work very closely with and do a lot of work with, uh, which is NERA Economic Consulting. They conduct the actual procurement events. They handle the bid solicitation. They handle the bid selection. They develop the contracts associated with a lot of the, a lot of the procurement events that we <coughs> conduct. And they, as a result, we have a, you know we have a very small internal staff at the IPA, but then we have a number of other entities that are sort of out there doing work uh, under the umbrella of the agency. That will continue through this bill. Um, the amount of funding that's available for those consultants is oftentimes dependent upon uh, Illinois providing us with the appropriation authority to pay them, uh, which means that we have to have some sort of a budget in place, whether it's just a stopgap budget that happens to have an appropriation for our agency or something more comprehensive. I think the biggest area of uncertainty going forward is not that we won't have the resources or that we won't have the authority to add on the expertise that we need. It's that if Illinois doesn't resolve its budget crisis, then our opportunity to have the appropriation that offers us a spending authority to actually make payments under some of those contracts uh, would be put into question. Now, one of the nice things about change of the RPS that doesn't so much address our personnel needs is that uh, the vast majority of the contracts, it's a little bit different for the, for the uh, Solar for All program because it's a state fund, but the vast majority of contracts under the revised RPS are purely between the utilities and between the providers of renewable energy credits. Now, we may be the entity that serves almost as a brokerage for the entry into of those contracts through the different processes that we run, whether it's a competitive procurement event or something like the Adjustable Block Program. But if the utility is the counterparty to the contract as opposed to the state, then all of the concerns around the state budget tend to go away. OK. Um, well, thank you very much. I want to um, thank both Katie and Brian for very clear, articulate presentations and for answering our questions. And they got a lot of work ahead of for them. And we'll be watching to see the progress that occurs in both of these states. We will also be having additional webinars, um, including a couple folks in the coming months on some other states that have expanded their RPSs or made changes. And as you could see on this slide here, there are a number of other webinars that CISA is doing in the coming weeks. So thank you very much for joining us today, and we look forward to having you join future webinars.